All right, here we go. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another of our Better Press for a Better World uh, webinar and podcast series. Uh, my name is Jeremy Steele. I'm the executive director of the Michigan Interscholastic Press Association. I am joined by Elizabeth Sear, who is the yearbook and newspaper advisor at Stockbridge High School and is a member of our board of directors at MIPA and advisor to our student advisory cohort of student journalists. Welcome, Elizabeth. And we are really excited today to welcome uh, Kathy Kalmeyer Frey. Um, hopefully you recognize her last name. Kathy was one of three students who was involved in the 1988 landmark US Supreme Court case, Hazelwood versus Kalmeyer. The case involved censorship of articles in the Spectrum, the student newspaper at Hazelwood East High School in St. Louis, Missouri. The school principal removed articles concerning teen pregnancy and divorce because he felt that the students could be identified in those articles amongst some other reasons. Uh, the Supreme Court ended up ruling against the students, opening the door to school administrators uh, to more easily censor, censor speech uh, and work by student journalists in school-sponsored publications. Kathy lives in Rogersville, Missouri, a small town in southwest Missouri, uh, and she has been speaking for a long time uh, to student journalists about student press issues. Uh, so we're really excited. Kathy, welcome. Um, if you are watching us on Zoom, as we move through uh, our session today, you can use the Q&A tool, which you should be able to click on at the bottom of your screen to send us in questions. And we will work to answer as many of those as we can uh, with the time that we have. So Kathy, again, welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about your story. All right, thank you guys. And I'm glad you guys all were able to sign in today and get involved in this. And hopefully you're gonna learn a little bit more than what you can actually read in a textbook by the end of my story. So if go back way in time um, and we're gonna go back into the early eighties. And at this point I am a junior in high school and I am in journalism one. And I'm going to have the opportunity to learn what it's like to be um, a real world journalist, hopefully. Um, and then once you finish J1, you're going to move into second semester and you're going to get to be on staff of the spectrum. I thought, okay, this is something up my alley because um, I like to write and I was kind of creative. So those things kind of went hand in hand with being on journalism staff. And it was something that is, was of interest to me. And during that point in time, we had a teacher that hopefully everyone has had throughout their uh, learning education time and that person was Mr. Sturgis. And he's the kind of teacher that you really connected with that you felt that you could go to with anything, whether it was just uh, something with school related or if it was something personal that you needed someone to be able to talk to. Sturgis was that guy for us and he was just um, important to us. And in journalism one, we learned right off the bat, we learned about prior restraint or prior review. And by definition, it says that prior restraint or prior review prohibits the government or the school from banning expression of ideas prior to their publication. The rule against prior restraint is based on the principle that freedom of the press is essential to a free society. And attempts by the school or the government to do so have largely been unsuccessful. And in basic translation, because that's the way that I operate is basic simple words, um, you can't censor. Little did I know how important that was going to be to me a very short time later. Another thing that Sturgis taught us about was Tinker versus Des Moines. And I'm sure you guys all know about it. In 1969, John Mary Beth Tinker um, and et al., um, another guy that was involved on it, but he never got his name listed. Um, they wore black armbands in protest of the Vietnam War. And it was just a silent protest. Um, and they were told they couldn't do that. But they, and they were in trouble at school. And so they sued the school district and they prevailed in it. And from Tinker versus Des Moines, it essentially came out with the, the decision that students do not shed their rights at the schoolhouse gate. Again, little did I know what that was going to mean to me a few months later. So um, we've now successfully completed first semester, passed journalism one, and we are now the Spectrum staff. And I was chosen to be the layout editor because like I had said earlier, I was kind of creative and I had that kind of niche where it was kind of my thing to be artsy. Um, and 
typically the Spectrum staff had done fluffy, pretty stories. And they did stories, um, things like, how's a sports team doing or how are um, homecoming queen, prom king and queen, those kind of things. But they never really had any hard hitting stories. And our staff decided we wanna do something a little different. So in journalism terms, um, and everybody usually laughs at me over this, there's a word called the morgue. And no, it's not where the dead people are. Um, in journalism, it's past story editions, um, past editions of the paper, um, maybe story ideas that never got off the ground, um, things along that nature. And we went to the morgue. Lo and behold, we found some story topics that were done um, 10 years before. And this was underneath Dr. Negri. And Dr. Negri approved these stories. Um, and they were relevant in the school 10 years before, and they're still relevant um, in the 80s. And so we, the topics that they covered were the problems of teenagers, relevant, right? Still relevant now. Um, those topics were divorce, marriage, runaways, pregnancy, and the squirrel rule. Um, and they are still relevant, I'm sure, in high schools today. And so we decided that um, we identified Hayes Woody's had a pregnancy problem, and we decided we're going to do stories like this. Now, keep in mind, um, that was 10 years before underneath Dr. Negri. This is Mr. Reynolds, who's now the principal, his very first year. And that's going to become important in the story, too. Um, so we're getting ready to work on these stories, and we take the approach that we wanted to um, talk to different people and what their experiences were with pregnancy. So in the student body at Hazelwood East, we had about 2,500 students in the school. And at any point in time, there could be 30 to 50 girls in the school that were pregnant. It was kind of a big deal. Um, it was enough to the point we had a daycare in the 80s, which is pretty forward um, because a lot of schools anymore don't even have that. Um, and it's few and far in between here in, in the Springfield area where my kids went to school um, for having that. Um, so for the 80s, that was a big deal. And Mr. Reynolds didn't like that fact because he didn't want the community to know there were kids in high school getting pregnant because shame on you, you shouldn't do that, right? Um, it's a personal choice, not his choice. Um, so the reason that we chose these three individuals that we talked to is because their experience was very different. One girl was, yay, it's sunshine and rainbows. I'm going to have a baby. It's going to be the best thing ever. One girl said, I'm pregnant. Um, I have to face it. And the other girl said, God, this is the worst thing that could possibly have ever happened to me. Um, and that was kind of hard for them to accept, but it's what they did. Um, and the reason that we chose them, again, was because they had very different stories to tell. Now, as being a journalist, you're taught of that it's important to be accurate on your with your sources. So once we had finished drafting the articles, we took it back to the students. We said, hey, if everything is accurate, would you guys read it? Make sure this is what you really meant to say. And if it is, sign it for us. Um, let's go one step further too, because you're high school students, you're minors for the most part, take it home to your parents and everything is accurate with them. Um, would you ask your parents to sign it too? Just because we wanted to cover our basis. We're trying to be responsible, right? That's what we're supposed to do. And so the viewpoints of these girls when we were getting them, um, it's not by any means promoting sex, go have teen sex is not what we're doing. The reason that we chose to do it is to maybe for a high school student, we don't always make the best choices. Maybe it's from the um, point of think about it before you do it. It's a lot of responsibility to be young, to try and have a baby and still go to high school. I can't imagine what it would be like. Um, but that's why we, we did it that way is because we're hopefully you'll to think about it. Um, and then at the beginning of those articles, it also gave the mention saying that the names had all been changed. There were no names in there that were actually legit. It said right up front that their names had been changed because we wanted to protect their identity. The next story that we talked about was um, the effects of divorce on teenagers and what it's like. Um, I was a child of divorced parents and my father was one of them that was mentioned in the story and my experience with it. Um, the neighborhood that I lived in had a divided entry and exit to it. It had a median through the center. And my dad came home so very lit one day that he drove through the center median of the neighborhood and put his car into the soccer coach's house because apparently that was going to be a parking spot for him. Um, now, don't you think the day that I got back to school um, that this happened? Do you think maybe anybody had learned about that and maybe somebody was talking about it? They did, of course, because it's a soccer coach. And for me as a high school kid, that was embarrassing. And we talked about things like that because we wanted kids to know that you're not walking this walk alone. There's other people out there that are going through similar things like you. 
And that was the purpose is to help the kids know that you're not alone, because how often do you feel as a high school kid that you're the only one dealing with something? And that's not the case. And that's the message we wanted to convey. So we talked to, to other parents on things like that, talked to the kids about what things were like. And again, we did the same thing. If everything is accurate, sign it. Parents and students alike, cover your bases, be accurate, do the right thing. <clears throat> And the story that I struggle with the most because it didn't get to run was about the runaways actually, not about the teen pregnancy or the divorce, but runaways. And in the runaway story, it um, gave different accounts of maybe why someone would consider running away. And it also gave hotline numbers that if you were considering running away, here's a number before you take that step, maybe make a phone call, maybe get some help before you do it. And the reason that I say I struggle with that one the most is because during this time of my high school career, um, I worked at Target and there was a student by the name of Reggie and Reggie ran away. And for whatever reason, wherever Reggie was going to, Reggie stopped in Target that, that day and he took his life in the bathroom of Target. And I struggle with that because I would really think in my heart that if the articles were there, Reggie would have read that article and maybe Reggie would have made that phone call and he'd still be here. Now, just, just this past November, I was speaking at a courthouse in St. Louis and telling the same story and a gentleman came up to me afterwards and he said, I just wanted to thank you for that story. And I'm like, okay. And he said, Reggie was my friend and I never knew what happened. I just knew that he died. And now I know how. And for me, experiencing that when you're working at Target and you're all of a sudden the store is shut down and everybody's evacuated out of the store because somebody took their life there and it's somebody you knew, that hits home, guys. That's hard. Um, and especially thinking that you had the tools at hand it could have maybe saved this guy's life, but your principal wouldn't allow it. Um, so at this point, the articles are, are getting ready. They're approaching to the point where we're going to run this to the press and Sturgis left. There was bad blood between Sturgis and Reynolds, the principal, and he left the teaching position and went into private industry. Um, and we're pretty devastated by that because here we are mid-session of getting these articles done. And he's gone. And they brought in a substitute teacher and she had no business being in a journalism classroom because she had no background in journalism. So questions that we would pose to her, she, I don't know, I don't know. So they decided that they would bring in the next player in the story and that was Mr. Emerson. And Mr. Emerson was the advisor from our rival high school, Hazelwood Central. And so now the paper is ready to go to press. And um, little did we know that it was Mr. Emerson's procedures with Central that he would take that edition of the paper down to the principal and they would review it together, um, which we had just learned that they weren't supposed to do, right? Um, lo and behold, what's happening and there's objections to it, but they never come back and tell us and give us any chances to make any changes to anything. They just run it as it is. Um, and so we get back to school and we're ready to sell the paper. We're excited. This is a you know powerful addition to the spectrum finally. And we get back and we're ready to get the paper and those pages are gone and we're kind of all scratching our head thinking, okay, what happened? Where are these pages at? Are we going to get them at a later point and we're going to insert them? Um, is it gonna be just a special edition with this spread? Where's the pages? And there was no one there to answer the questions because Ms. Adams, the substitute teacher, she didn't have a clue. So we decided that we're going to take a trip downstairs to Mr. Reynolds and we're going to ask questions of him. Um, Jeremy, would you mind putting that article up please? <coughs> Guys, this is what the, the paper was supposed to look like. Um, pressure describes it all for today's teenagers, and, and there's, there's what it's going to be like. Um, pretty just a lot of reading, you know, a few little graphics in there, and a ghosting um, of the pregnant girl. And so we get down to Mr. Reynolds' office, and we said, Guys, uh, we, you know, Mr. Reynolds, we don't understand. Where's the rest of the paper at? And he says, um, I'm sorry, but that edition of the paper, those articles are trash. They are too mature for an immature audience. Um, and we're, we're not going to have it. And go figure, maybe I'm a bit outspoken. And I pose the question to him. I'm sorry, but if you're old enough to get pregnant, shouldn't you be old enough to read about it? Yeah, he didn't like that question or that response so very much. Um, so didn't start off on the right foot, but it's a valid question, right? I mean, you know, what's the point of it? If you can't, if you're doing it, surely you can read about it. Um, and he says, well, no, no, I know who all these people are in, in the story. I can, I can tell you who all these people are. I said, great. Show me, tell me, see the, the girl up there. Um, how many of you guys think that she's pregnant? Jeremy, here's your, here's your shot. <laughs> uh, I mean, from that picture, it doesn't look like it. 
Okay. Um, a lot of people typically say yes. And Mr. Reynolds figured he knew who she was and he named someone. And I said, nope, you're wrong. And again, my outspokenness gets me in a slight bit of trouble. And I say to him, um, gee, you know, Mr. Reynolds, through immaculate conception, even guys can get pregnant. And he looked at me and he was like, what are you talking about? You take a sweatshirt, sweater, you roll it up, you stuff it underneath your shirt. Voila, you two can be pregnant just like that. He didn't like that because I said, no, Mr. Reynolds, that's me. And in high school, I was obviously a pretty skinny little girl. I wasn't pregnant until I was 28, but that was me. And it shot him down and, it, and he got angry about it because he thought he knew everything. And so he said, no, we're not going to have that. The paper's not, that's not gonna happen. And he said, so here's the deal, because we protested, we said, we're not gonna sell the paper. He said, oh, she will. He said, because if you don't, you're not gonna have the next edition of the paper. And the next edition to the come out on the paper was to be the senior superlative. So it was important to all the seniors. And of course there's more seniors in the class than the juniors. So guess who wins the vote? It's, it's the seniors. Um, so the seniors decide they're gonna go downstairs and they're gonna sell the newspaper for 25 cents. And mind you, there's also the um, opportunity for outside community to also get the paper because then the secret's out. The secret's out telling the community there's pregnant kids in Hazelwood East. And that's what he didn't want. So you can take that back down, but that gives you an idea of where things are at and what that paper looked like. Um, so the seniors are downstairs selling the paper. I have my one big, brave, big girl moment of high school and I snuck out of class. And I, I know this is gonna be hard to believe. Those of you that are in high school, we didn't have cell phones, right? Who'd have thought? Um, and so we, I sneak out of class and I go to the library where a landline phone is and um, call Mr. Sturgis. And I said, hey, Sturge, here's what just happened. I said, the paper got censored. He's like, no, 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 you're wrong. And I'm like, no, I'm serious, it's a heart attack. This is what happened. And I said, what can we do to get this to run? And, you know, because he's that teacher that you believe, the end all be all, the alpha and the omega. He says, call the ACLU. Okay, okay. I don't know who they were. You know, I'm a high school kid. What do I know about the ACLU? He says, call them and they're gonna help you. I'm like, okay. So I sneak back into class and I'm like, okay. Here's what Sturge said to do, guys. And so we're talking about it and okay, we're in agreement. So we go home that night and we talk to our parents and our, my mom, of course, she's a little spitfire, go figure. Apple didn't fall from that tree, right? And she tells me, she says, do you think what you're doing is right? And I said, well, yeah. I said, we believe in what, what our product is. Um, this is why um, we think that the stories can help everybody. No, do they relate to everybody? No, but if they help one person, then aren't we doing our job? And yeah, and she's like, okay. She said, then do it. So we call the ACLU and tell them what's happened and they're interested. They said, we'd like to talk to you guys in person. Um, so it ends up with three of us that actually approach the ACLU. It's myself, um, Leslie Edwards and Leanne Tippett. Um, and my name was first alphabetically, which I've had seen questions of why, why it's your name and nobody else, because I'm first in the alphabet, that's why. If you have an early letter alphabet, I guess K is you know advanced up the food chain, you can be the first one in a case. Um, so we go and talk to the ACLU and they said, yeah, we'd, we'd like to do this for you. Um, you know, we're not understanding all the processes because we're 17, 18 year old kids in high school. And, you know, what do we know? Um, but this is what we're going to proceed with. They say, well, we'll get an attorney for you. Her name was Miss Leslie Edwards and she was a newer attorney. Um, and, and we're going to help you work through this process. Um, so what do you think happens when the ACLU gets involved? Do you think it's something that everybody's quiet about? Or do you think maybe that the news media is picking up on things? Well, you're right. The news media gets involved. It's, it's not a quiet thing. There's a lot of publicity coming to the school. Mr. Reynolds is fuming at this point. He's not a happy camper. Um, the local papers at that point in time were St. Louis Globe to St. Louis Globe Democrat and St. Louis Post Dispatch. Guess who decided to run those articles? Right? We're just worried about the little high school worried about finding out about it or the little small community of Hazelwood and Florissant. St. Louis found out. Um, they ran the articles. Then, take it one step further, USA Today ran them and uh, the New York Times also ran them. So now he is really not a happy camper. And they're calling, um, they're coming on campus because the TV stations want to interview me. You know, I had that pretty big fluffy hair thing going on. There's book covers being done. It's a crazy thing going on. Um, so there was a guy at that point in time called Phil Donahue. And Phil Donahue, for those of you, you know, Elizabeth shaking her head, she's, you know, we're 
we know who he is, right? Because we're older, but you guys go, who is Phil Donahue, high school students? Um, Phil Donahue was the Oprah of the 80s. Cool, right? He had a show in Chicago. Guess who called us and wanted us to come on the TV show? Phil, it's a free trip to Chicago with three high school girls, no parental units involved. We're going to Chicago and it's going to be fun, right? So we go and we do the TV show. It airs. Um, we get back to high school. Guess who I'm invited to come and see? It's Mr. Reynolds, a personal invitation for me to come to his office. And he says, Miss Kuhlmeyer, um, I saw the show that you were on. He goes, that's really great. He says, um, here's the problem. You didn't ask my personal permission to go and do that. And I'm like, no, my mom said I could. Here's my note. Um, I'm like, I don't understand. He says, if you ever decide you're going to do something like that again, first, I can suspend you or two, I can expel you for doing that. And I'm like, but my mom said I could. Why? Why? You know, you're painting a bad light on our school and that's not okay. And so from that, he then decided that I'm now a bad kid. Okay. Not the case. Um, in high school, obviously, I was involved in journalism. Excuse me. Got a little itchy, itchy Missouri nose going on with allergy season. Um, I was involved in marching band. I played soccer. I was in drama. And I was an honor student. So it's not like I was a bad kid. I never even had, had detention. But now I'm threatening, threatened to be suspended or expelled because I was on the Phil Donahue show. Scratch your head moment, right? Yeah. Um, mama didn't like that one either. She said, you know, threaten my child. So mama's on the phone at him. Um, and so there we get back into class one day and now there is a letter that is typed. And I know that again, hard to believe we didn't have computers going on at that time. We had typewriters and there was an anonymous letter that was typed and slapped on the board that told us don't do this anymore. Just stop everything with this ACLU. You're causing a problem. Not okay. Um, did we stop there? No, we just continued with it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hazelwood East was kind of a different school. We didn't have walled classrooms and doors. It was an open concept school. So we had movable walls. And Mr. Reynolds became my own little stalker. And wherever I would go um, in school, he was going to make sure that I was in class. And every day he would go to my chem class and Mr. Moore would say, she's here. Would you leave her alone? But I was there all the time. Um, now, seniors, I know some of you are like, you know, you're ready for that moment where you're walking across the stage and you're excited because graduation moment is here, right? And hey, and you're shaking hands with the principal and you're cheesing it up and you're excited and your family's yelling. Um, my graduation picture like that is the sight of Mr. Reynolds' head because he wouldn't even look at me. Sad moment, right? I didn't do anything wrong. Um, my friends in high school thought that it was kind of fun, though, some of them, that I was doing this and they made me a shirt and it said SH you know what, disturber on it? Guess what I wore underneath my cap and gown? And I wanted to do the Superman thing as I'm walking across the stage and go flat, you know, but my mom was in the audience. She would have been mortified had I done that. So I had the wisest decision, don't do that. But I wore it um, just as the principle of the matter because that's who I apparently had become. Um, I'm the pot stirrer of the school. Um, so now it, this is kind of rolling along. We have made it through um, the Missouri Supreme Court and we lost. Um, little did we know at that point what kind of an attorney that the ACU had brought in for us. Um, and, and we thought that, that was the end of the road, you know, again, not understanding the whole processes. I guess they didn't educate us well enough on what the court processes were because who'd have thought of something of just trying to get articles run that we're going to actually end up in US Supreme Court. Um, so, we are told then that we can appeal the, the case. And we're like, okay, well, that's what we want to do because, you know, it's the principle of the matter. We're doing this to help our students. And we wanted the articles run in our paper. We don't care about the rest of the world. We wanted the spectrum to run in Hazelwood East. Um, so it is, it goes through this um, appellate courts and we won. Um, and when you're in court, you're there for a long time. And when I took the stand, I was on there for four hours and I was really intimidated by it because it's a long time. And Again, being a little high school kid, um, you're facing these men in suits that, you know, you have respect for. And, and because they're older, you, you know, you respect your elders. Um, but it was scary. Um, so that's all going on. And at this point, to give you guys kind of a, an idea of how slow the wheels of justice work. Remember, this started in 1983, right? And I'm a junior in high school. Um, we have rolled along now and we have made it in, into 1988. I'm now a senior in college. Um, and apparently there wasn't good communication and going back again to the fact of no, no cell phones. Um, the case has gone to the US Supreme Court. 
And being in college these four years, I'm away from school. Um, and the reason I mentioned the cell phones is because the case went to US Supreme Court. Miss Edwards never told me that this was happening because it cost her long distance phone call money and she wasn't making a lot of money on anything. I didn't get to go. This case carries my name. It's impacted the country. Guess where I didn't go? Um, so that all, all I can tell you is from what I have heard, um, things that I have listened to online myself, um, but she botched our case. Um, you know, I had told you that the things that were kind of important about it, we had changed the names. The stories had been previously run. We um, had permission on all of this. She didn't bring these things up. These are key factors with what the decision came down and she didn't bother to mention it. When you go to the US Supreme Court, they offer you essentially what's called a mock trial. She turned it down. What are the chances? You're, you're going into the grandest court in the land. You think you're so good, you don't need this preparation. She didn't do it. Um, I'm gonna backtrack from it. Jeremy, we talked about the, the poll. Is that something that's out there? <coughs> yeah, we can put it out there. Yeah, if you would put it out there about um, the, the writ with how many cases. I think I blew right past the first one. <laughs> Um, every year there's, how many cases do you think get to the Supreme Court? Do you think it's a small amount of things that are presented to the court through what's called a writ of certiorari, or do you think it is, um, a lot or a little? Um, and what, what happens is that actually, is there a time that we can do it? Uh, we've got folks who are voting, voting right now. So oh, right um, now. do you think that there's a <laughs> lot of cases that can presented to the U.S. Supreme Court or a little? Survey says. So it looks like that most <laughs> people, we've got kind of a, a division between kind of eh, a few and not very many at all. Uh, okay. So So most people are saying that I don't know, maybe half or fewer. Okay, so in the real world, every year there's about 10,000 cases that are actually presented to the U.S. Supreme Court on what's called a writ of certiorari, and then the court decides how many of those they're going to take. Now, the amount that they actually take is only about 75 to 80 out of 10,000 cases. Guess who's got chosen? We're the golden ticket. Um, so it goes to court. I don't know anything about it, so I'm obviously not there. Um, I get a phone call on January 13th, 1988. And again, it's my senior year of college and it's a winter, wintry day sitting in my classroom. And I get a phone call from a local reporter from the Southeast Missouri and the local paper in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, asking my opinion on losing the case. And I thought, excuse me, I don't think I have a comment. I don't know what you're talking about because I didn't even know that it was being heard. Um, so I hang up from him and I go and I call Miss Edwards and I said, what happened? And she's like, I can't talk. I'm busy. Click. Cool. Thanks for your help there. Um, and again, I wasn't there, but what I did learn from it, there is a website called OYE, which is O-Y-E-Z. You can go in and actually listen to Miss Edwards presenting the case um, in front of the justices. And it's a constant embarrassment to me because they're saying, Miss Edwards, what do you mean? Miss Edwards, what are you trying to say? Miss Edwards, what this? Miss Edwards, what that? She could never get anything straight. And again, she didn't bring up the fact that the articles had been previously published underneath a different principle. She didn't bother to mention that the names had been changed. She didn't mention that um, we had the consent of everybody and we lost. And I'm gonna actually read to you um, what the dissenting, the decision was on it. That year we lost, it was in a decision of um, five to three. And I know you guys are probably thinking, well, there's nine justices, dumb, dumb. Um, this year, there was only eight on the panel. Um, had we actually tied at 4-4, we would have won the case because we did win the appellate level, um, but not the case. So the decision actually says, the rule against prior restraint does not apply to the publication of student-operated student school newspapers. In Hazelwood School District v. Kuhlmeyer, the Supreme Court upheld a public school principal's decision to remove certain controversial material from the school newspaper. The principal based his decision on fears that articles on teen pregnancy and divorce would allow students to identify classmates who had encountered such difficulties. But how? Because we said that we took those things out and we changed names and everything. So obviously, it goes back to my point of guess who didn't properly inform them of what was what. Um, Justice Byron R. White ruled that educators did not offend the First Amendment by exercising editorial control so long as their actions are reasonably related 
to legitimate pedagogical, which is teachers and educators concerns. In essence, it said that the rights of public school students are not necessarily the same as those of adults in other settings. A different test applies to censorship by school officials of student expression in a school sponsored activity, such as a student newspaper that was not a public forum for student expression. So essentially what that did guys was it took the tinker standard and said out the window, if you're a student journalist, it doesn't apply because of legitimate pedagogical concerns that the school authorities have the right to come in and do essentially what they want to your papers. Why is that a problem? It, it's because of the fact that you guys are finding that you're self-censoring yourselves. You're afraid to speak up and talk about things that you want to do. Um, there is a movement across the country called New Voices of USA. Um, and there's also, it's Facebook pages. You guys can find it in your state, unfortunately, is enough state that has got the law passed in yet. Go figure, neither is Missouri. Um, but I travel and I speak around the country on helping states to get this law passed. And what it does essentially will restore the rights um, to student journalists, whether it be high school or collegiate. It kind of applies differently for um, private schools, but it would restore the rights to high school and collegiate students for your publications um, because the courts got it wrong. Um, and the reason for it goes back to Miss Edwards. And unfortunately, Miss Edwards' fate, um, because of losing something to this grandeur, she lost her law practice. She became ill and she passed away. And I kind of think that this losing this case aided her um, for losing it um, because she did alter the course of history throughout this. Um, and why is it important today is because it's happening everywhere. Um, the most recent state that I worked with so far has been Nebraska. And I found that it was almost like a Me Too movement across the country um, when it comes to censorship because there were a multitude of kids standing up saying this is happening to me and they're talking to their representatives they're talking to senators giving their testimonies um, in the court saying it's happening all the time and you guys are the such bright individuals it's amazing how because of technology what this has done for you guys to enable you to be such um, critical thinkers um, you're usually the upper echelon of your schools you are talented you're educated you're our future and and we need to hear what you're saying. And the courts today, I think if the case were presented today, um, I think we would come out with a different decision. I mean, one thing, I would definitely look for a better attorney, obviously. Um, but also, I think our courts aren't as conservative as what they were in the 80s, because if you look at the things that are passing through the courts, now you're finding things that are much different that they're giving the approvals to. Um, and that's, that's the reason that we're still doing it. But kids are saying that you know, they can't do it. Um, advisors are finding that, that their jobs are being threatened and that's unfortunate. Um, and on a side note, my own son, who's now 21 and getting ready to start his senior year of college, hard to believe, um, but during his junior year of high school, he was censored. Now the parallels between that and what happened to me are very uncanny, um, both juniors in high school. Um, he had a new principal, a new advisor had just come into school um, and ours was, Mr. Reynolds or Sturgis had left us. Um, prior to this new advisor coming in, I would go into the classroom every single year um, and talk to the kids and say, you know, this is my story and kind of give them a whole rundown on everything. Um, so the, the exiting teacher told the new teacher coming in that, you know, this is who I am. Um, I have a little background on it. My son comes home from school one day and says that the article that they're doing about the water gun game assassins, which is a rite of passage for the seniors, um, and it's just a who, what, when, where, why um, story that had been censored. And he's like, I, I don't get it. I said, well, do you want me to call and talk to her? He's like, yeah, that'd be cool. So I call and I talk to the teacher the next day. He's the one that answered the phone because he's working after class on a project. And I said, you know, introduced myself. And I said, I'm Eric's mom. Um, and she says, well, what's the problem? And I'm like, how often do you, would, you know, would you answer the phone and go, what's, your, what's the problem? And I said, my, my son came home with me and he's concerned about an article not being published. And I said, I'm just trying to find some answers. She goes, well, what business is it of yours? Um, what's going on in my classroom? And I said, well, he's my son. So that's kind of, you know, my business. And two, I said, you know, I said, I think maybe you understand who I am and what my background is and, and why I would question censorship. She said, well, who do you think you are to know anything about censorship? I said, oh. Um, so it turned into a pretty ugly matter. Um, Student Press Law Center of Washington, D.C. ended up having a lovely conversation with them and helping them to understand what their rights were. 
um, but the kids were threatened. Um, they were told that if they were seniors and she had written letters of recommendation, she'd revoke them. And she also told my son, who was to be the editor in chief for the next year, that if they pursued this any further with SPLC, that he wouldn't be the editor in chief. And well, they can't do that to you. That, that's where they're stepping on a line because a threat shouldn't be made because you guys are working on writing stories. That's part of the educational process. It's kind of where you get your feet wet to find out if you want to pursue this into college and maybe a lifelong career. Um, so it's unfortunate those things like that happen, but they're happening everywhere. Um, so the moral of the story is one person may not think that they matter, that your voice isn't important, but it really is. Um, and the reason that I continue to do this is because it does matter. It's an issue across the country and it's unfortunate that it's still happening, but it's my hope that through working through working, working through working, um, working with the different states that I can help to get laws passed across the country that will hopefully make a difference for students um, across the country and help the, the, our courts understand why it's relevant. It's relevant because if you don't get the opportunity to talk about it, to be educated on it when you're young and in high school, when are you gonna have that opportunity? Um, and you're seeing a decline through newspapers. Um, and it's unfortunate because people are getting bad tastes for things like this. Yes, my degree is in mass communications, journalism, advertising and commercial art. Did I ever pursue that? No, no, I didn't. Um, because of the fact that I got such a bad taste from doing things like this, um, and seeing what can actually happen with the processes. It's unfortunate. Um, so fast forward now into just within the last seven years. Um, I am now going to University of Missouri, Kansas City. I'm gonna give a presentation with the top five cases in the country on freedom of um, First Amendment rights. And Mr. Reynolds is there. It's the first time I've really crossed paths with him um, since all this has happened. And we're standing in the waiting area, waiting to be picked up by the shuttle bus to shoot us across to the school and he wants to give me a hug and I'm like, mm, you're in my bubble. We are not friends. Um, and so we kind of start off on the wrong foot on that and we get into this great big room and it is just packed. It is filled with um, educators and lawyers and you know law students, collegiate, um, high school students, packed. I mean, lots and lots and lots of people. Um, and so we're sitting there and it's our session and the question comes up of Mr. Reynolds, what did you think of the articles? You know, why? He says, now an audible gasp is going to come with this one in this big room. I never read the articles. He said it was a budget cut. I never read them. I said, but you told us the articles were trash. You know, and we're having this heated conversation at this point. He's telling me what a good kid I was. And I said, you didn't make me feel like a good kid at all. I said, because you followed me everywhere. I said, you intimidated me. And now you've changed the course of history. And you're telling me you never read the articles? Did you or didn't you? And everybody was just like, are you kidding me? So I don't know if that ever actually, if you read them or not, because he told us that they were trash, but you've altered the course of history. So what's the deal? Um, and another thing I would like to tell you guys is about real briefly, um, then we're gonna open it up for questions, is um, background on Bethel v. Frazier. And the reason that I wanna talk about Bethel and Morris v. Frederick from 2002, we're talking all within the same few years of Hazelwood decision coming down. Um, and the intent of what is behind those two cases in comparison to Hazelwood. And the reason that I do that is because um, Hazelwood is just talking about relevant problems in the school um, and trying to be helpful. And if I'm gonna to read to you, um, Bethel v. Frazier, um, what the speech was in that one. And the reason that I choose to do it is because that's really stepping across the line of what is appropriate for high school um, and what is not. And if you listen closely, it's all about the innuendos and how it was read. Um, and I got to hear this firsthand, and that's why I bring this one up. So this is a provocative speech for student body election, um, and it goes like this. I know a man who is firm. He's firm in his pants, he's firm in his shirt, and his character is firm, but most of all, his belief in you, the students of Bethel, is firm. Jeff Kuhlman is a man who takes his point and pounds it in. If necessary, he'll take an issue and nail it to the wall. He doesn't attack things in spurts. He drives hard, pushing and pushing until finally he succeeds. Jeff is a man who will go to the very end, even the climax for each and every one of you. So vote for Jeff for ASB vice president. He'll never come between you and the best our high school can be. Now, who do you think won? Do you think the students won on that one? No, they didn't. 
Um, the school district prevailed on that one because it wasn't appropriate for high school. The next one that we talk about is 2002, Morris B. Frederick. And the background on that one is um, he was a student in high school um, and he went part-time part high school, part-time to um, off-campus school, like in, in the university. So he did one of those things. He comes back to school. He's sitting outside in the outside commons waiting for his girlfriend to get off school. And campus security says, you can't be here. This isn't the time that you're a student. He doesn't like that idea um, and is pretty upset about it. He's threatened with, um, you know, about being around. And so he's going to he's gonna do something to maybe draw a little bad press to the school. At um, this point in time, it, it's the Olympics, year of the Olympics, and um, it takes place in Anchorage, Alaska. And the Olympic torch is going to be going down the, the street right in front of the school. Um, and maybe do you think when the, um, that's happening, maybe the media is around? Sure, because they want to see what's going on. Um, Mr. Frederick makes this um, giant banner. It's about five foot by seven, and it says, Bong Hits for Jesus. Now, who do you think that as the, the cameras are panning and the, the Olympic torch is going, who do you think that they see Bong Hits for Jesus, not the Olympic torch? And now the school is mad because they're just drawing the attention to this high school kid and what he's done. And again, school didn't, the school didn't want, not the student, because it's not necessary. And the reason that I, again, that I talk about that is because those are things that are crossing the line for what is appropriate for high school versus talking about relevant issues in high school. Um, so in a nutshell, that is my story. Um, I would encourage all of you to stand upon the platform of stand up and speak out, which is what I is passionate to me um, through Cure Hazelwood. Um, if you're interested in, in pursuing things along the lines of um, New Voices of USA, work with your local representatives and senators to hopefully get the bill rolling in your state, get someone that will sponsor your bill um, and give your testimonies, guys. If these things are happening to you, talk about it because it needs to be heard because if it's not, nothing's going to change. Um, I would be happy to come up and help you guys with that. Um, I also have a Facebook page called Hazelwood B. Coolmeyer. go figure. Um, and I would appreciate any comments that you guys would leave on there um, about what you think about what I've told you today. Or if you just have questions, you just want to reach out to me and ask questions of me, do so. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear what's happening in your schools and if I can help at all. Um, so that's it. But again, one person can make a difference and it, it doesn't have to be something that makes its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It can just be something that you're passionate about. Um, do so through respective conversations with people just because you're told no doesn't mean it has to be the final answer. It can be a matter of a respectable, respectable conversation and maybe by them, you explaining yourself to administration or whatever, if that's the case, um, maybe they'll understand better and maybe your answer will become yes, that you can do something that you didn't think you could. But just because you're told no doesn't mean it has to be the end of the road. But just remember, it needs to be a respectable conversation. And ultimately, you want to work for things towards the greater good of everybody. Um, so stand up and speak out. Kathy, when, when you were going through this as a junior in high school and even as you were going into college, did you have any idea of the ramifications of this court that this court case was going to have on, on student media? Absolutely not. Um, because who would have ever thought that it would have gone to where it is today? Um, we just wanted the articles published in our own paper. We just felt passionately about it, that we were doing the right thing and trying to help somebody. Um, do I wish it was different? Of course, um, because I see the impact that it's had on people and it's very unfortunate because that wasn't the intent at all. When, when did you really kind of pick up the baton to um, be an advocate to change this court president precedent. I know you've, you've been speaking about this case for a long time, but kind of at what point did that switch turn on for you that, that you had a platform to be able to do good and, and hopefully you know start to turn this case around? Um, oh, it's probably been the last 10 to 12 years that I've been traveling um, and speaking this much um, because it needs to be talked about, because if we don't talk about it, it it's going to die down and that's not what we want. We want the momentum to continue to snowball um, and get bigger and people to be excited about it and want to make the change. And it just takes all of us being involved in doing it. I know that some of the students who are, I know some of the schools that where students are from um, 
who are watching us now. And, and it varies a lot, obviously, in Michigan from school to school as to what the situation is. So we have school districts where student journalists have a lot of freedom to do whatever they want and school district policy protects them. And we have other districts where the principals are more like Mr. Reynolds was at your school. What are, what are you hearing as you're talking with students and teachers out there across the country? What kinds of stories are, are you hearing from them? It really depends on where I'm at. Um, for instance, the Kirkwood Call in St. Louis is an amazing publication um, where they don't have these issues because they have such a good working relationship between the staff and administration. They don't face that. Um, but yet when I was in St. Louis um, and I was talking to the kids at Hazelwood, they're still being censored and that's really sad. Um, and go figure, I've never been welcomed back to the high school either like Mary Beth Tucker was when she got to go back for her 50th anniversary and they gave her her own locker where they've made a tribute to the Tinker um, Hazelwood that still doesn't want me to come back. Um, and, and it's sad, but these kind of things are happening everywhere. Kids are talking about um, the gay lesbian rights, things that are going on with that. They're talking about problems with um, vaping and, and all juuling and things like that where you know, they, these are things that they're talking about in school because kids are doing it. They're wanting to talk about the ramifications of doing that and they're being told no, but these are things that that is relevant to the kids today. And if they can't learn about it in school where things are hopefully being covered responsibly, what are they gonna do? Go out and try things on their own and maybe not get the right information themselves um, because the internet isn't always our friend. It's not always telling us exactly what the truth is and hopefully um, the students being good journalists, they are giving you the straight facts on it. And maybe it, it would make some kids make some different decisions before they experimented on things. You, you mentioned, Kathy, the New Voices movement. We've, we've had a version, it's been several years, but we, we did have a, a bill that made it through uh, legislative committee and then died in the state Senate here. I know in your home state of Missouri, you've you all have tried several times to get new voices legislation passed to kind of roll back the Hazelwood standard to make it more difficult again for principals to censor. What, and you mentioned in Nebraska too, where you're doing advocacy work. What are you hearing in your home state and others from people who don't wanna change from the Hazelwood status quo? What, what are they saying about the work that student journalists do? Why don't they wanna protect student rights? Honestly, they're afraid of the kids. The administrators are afraid of the kids because the kids are so smart. Um, they're afraid of what they may say. Um, and they feel that they need to have that ultimate editorial control to censor the kids because they don't want them talking about things. They're, they're protecting their own image of the paper or perhaps even the school's image in their minds from talking about things that are relevant. Um, but the kids are so amazing. That's the problem. I, I look at my own son thinking, how did I produce this? ultra smart kid you know what did I do right but if that's what it boils down to is they're intimidated by the kids and it goes back to the fact of technology that's they can find out anything they want it's amazing uh Kathy in um my understanding and I'd like you to um share what you know about this is that um one defense to administrators is that when they start censoring the words then they become responsible for them and if they trust the students, then um, they open up the form where the students then own the responsibility for what they say and do. And it's a much more critical learning experience. Am, am I right about that? Yes, it, it is. And, and I think that overall, I think the kids, they wanna do the right thing. They don't want to go out and um, promote things incorrectly. They don't want to bad mouth people, they want to inform and be responsible journalists and the high school paper or media sources, whatever you might have in your particular school, it's magazine or whatever, that's where you get your feet wet and you learn and you you learn because and about what is real and what is right and what is wrong um, and get your feet wet for looking at this as a potential career, like I mentioned earlier, um, but it is critical thinking. and. And you guys are the, the cream of the crop when it comes to being a journalism student. It, you're not getting the kids that are out looking to start trouble. Listen, I mean, the, if the administration would listen to the kids, think of where we could be. 
we've we've got a couple of questions from students who are who are wondering about like the conditions where principals are allowed to censor. Um, Lauren's asking, right, if, if the girls were pregnant and their parents were giving permission, what gives the principal the power to censor this article? Um, and another student uh, in our Q and A forum is asking about like the conditions that um, where censorship is allowed. Um, Kathy, can you talk a little bit about kind of you, you mentioned that legitimate pedagogical purpose being one of the key phrases that came out of the Hazelwood case. What is what's your understanding about what that means in practice in terms of what a school administrator is allowed to censor under that language? Essentially, it's giving him the ultimate power of the paper that if he feels that you're writing a story that he doesn't like, whether it be the topic, the tone, um, facts within it, he's got the right to yank it because of the Hazelwood decision now. And, and that's unfortunate um, because it did take away tinkers where it didn't matter. Um, the reason that it did with, with the pregnancy stories is because he, again, it goes back, he didn't want anyone to know outside the walls of Hazelwood that there was a pregnancy problem in that school and he was trying to protect the image. The, uh, the tinker case that you mentioned for folks who may not remember that from their, stu their uh, student free speech um, lessons. Uh, the standard that that put in place, one of the key elements of that is that speech would have to somehow disrupt school um, for administrators to be able to step in and censor it. So the classic example of that is like a walkout or um, a protest or something that would disrupt the normal school day. Um, Hazelwood, as you mentioned, has this legitimate pedagogical purpose or basically an educational reason. Um, so it could be anything from uh, typos in language to whatever, if, if, if the principal can come up with some sort of reason why he's got an, educa right, an educational purpose, which is very broad um, to censor, then, then the courts back him up on it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have yeah. talked about sex in high school because it doesn't happen. I'm sure it doesn't happen in any school right now. There's no one pregnant walking the halls. Well, maybe it happened in the 80s, Kathy, but certainly not now, right? Those of course not. issues are not, not important course. at all to teenagers. Right, anymore. right. Shame on us, wild and crazy kids. And it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned how um, kind of the, the case with you happened with, uh, uh, you know, a new advisor, right? There was this sort of transition that happened. And from my position running a state association, that's oftentimes when, when I hear about these kinds of situations too, is you've had a change in the journalism teacher or you've got a change in the principal or some other administrator at the school um, to where that, right, that legacy of trust and understanding that may have been built is now gone. Uh, so you've got new people who are coming in who, who just don't have confidence, unfortunately, in the, the quality of the journalism that students are producing. All true. Trust uh, how, how else, Kathy, has this case changed your life? Or, I mean, obviously you speak about it now, but are there other ways that going through this process has, has changed you? It has. Um, it has very much shaped who I am. Um, I am a person that doesn't back down on things. Um, it has molded me to, if I believe in something that I will stand up for it, no matter what it is. Um, and it's also helped me to shape my kids in the same fashion. Um, when my son was born, he was born with a very rare birth defect and he required a special feeder, um, to be able to eat. I couldn't breastfeed him because of him having a, a cleft palate and the feeder that he required was very expensive and insurance wouldn't cover it. Um, they said it wasn't medically necessary. Yet my son was born on his due date, full term baby, um, good size, and by uh, six months old, he only gained two pounds, um, and that was failure to thrive. And so I took my my personal case to the insurance company, and I fought them, and I said I won because I proved the fact that it was medically necessary for him to have this expensive bottle because it was like thirty five dollars for a bottle that lasted two days, and that's a lot of money when it comes to a kid that needs to eat constantly and and can't. Um, but I won, but that just, it doesn't matter to the level of what you're, you're taking something on, stand up for yourselves because you, you do have rights. Um, and if you don't use your own voice for things, even to this degree, you're being told no on things that you really shouldn't be. And, you, and like I said, it can be a responsible um, conversation 
to prove your point and overturn decisions just like I did. So yeah, it's, it's made me, it's made me I'm, glad, I'm glad you're talking about that because um, one of the things that I see happening is that um, students self-censor, particularly girls. I know that SPLC has um, worked on this and um, tried to advocate in this manner. And I'm just wondering, based on what you just said, if you have some words of advice for students who are fearful um, that they may be censored or they don't pursue an angle far enough because they're worried about what's gonna happen to them um, you know, in a state like ours. Make sure that you're accurate. Um, have all your ducks in a row. Um, make sure you know your sources that you're getting your information from is accurate. Um, document, document, document. Um, and and in, like in our case, where if it's something where it's a matter of involving um, minors, go back and, and get the parental consent. Go back like, just like we did and say, is this accurate? Is it right? If it is, sign it. Let, let's, that way you know we're, you're covering your basis and you can go back to your administration and go, look, we did the right thing. Um, but if you don't try it and you don't push the bar a little bit, how are you gonna know if you can do it or not? Um, and just because someone says no doesn't mean that that's the end of the road. Find other ways to work around things to make it successful for you. Because if you don't, you're giving into things that you really don't always have to give into. I've always pushed my kids to, if you believe in something, do it. I will support you um, because I am that crazy mama bear that don't mess with my babies. <laughs> I see that side of me come out. It's not pretty, but it happens. And, and guys, I'm sure you all have mama bears in your life too that will stand up for you and believe in you. Um, just like my mom did it with me. She was a, she was big, she's a little mama, um, but she was scrappy and, and I'm just a bigger scrappy than what my mom was. Well, and it's, it's so important to stand up for what is right and, and what you believe in and know that, yeah, there are a lot of organizations. I don't know if there are more organizations out there now than there were in the 80s when you were facing this, Kathy, but I, I think that students hopefully have the ability with social media and cell phones and text messaging to connect with groups like the Student Press Law Center, which we've mentioned, the SPLC in Washington or, or MIPA or the Journalism Education Association or other groups out there uh, that, that can help them, that can help teachers and help students through these kinds of, of situations when uh, students think they might have been, might be being censored for uh, the wrong reason. So, Is there anything that, that, Kathy, that you would have done differently if you had to go, other than maybe getting a different lawyer, um, to, if, <laughs> that you'd do differently if you could go back to the 1980s and, and go through this again? Um, you nailed that part. I mean, that I would definitely 100% unequivocally do. Um, but I think I would also try and help my friends in high school understand the reason why we're doing it because uh, students, my friends, students and, and faculty at that point didn't really get it. They thought we were just trying to cause a scene um, and draw bad publicity to the school and that wasn't the case at all. Um, and now because of Facebook, um, people that are friending me and, and we're reconnecting now, they're saying, I'm sorry that I treated you the way that you did. And I think I, if I would have maybe and I don't know how I would have done it, but just to explain the fact that I'm standing up for our rights for us, not for the school. I'm not trying to paint the school in a bad light, but I'm trying to protect our rights under the constitution that we learned about in school um, for the greater good for all of us. Um, and again, it goes back to getting that story published with the hotline number in it for the runaways and maybe Reggie would still be here. And again, it doesn't apply to everybody, but if it helped one person, then I did my job. Um, and that's what that's what I think would be different is just working harder to explain why we were doing it um, because it, I guess that message wasn't conveyed properly, but it's nice for people to come back now and say, I understand and I'm sorry that I didn't treat you fairly. And I do see now as an adult um, that you were trying to make a difference and, and help all of us. And it's kind of fun when they come back and say, your name's in our history book that our kids are reading about. So that that's kind of fun for me. And my kids are kind of proud that Mom leaves a legacy um, for them that, that, that their mom did stand up for things. And, and they know that if there's ever a problem that they're facing, that they can always come back to me, even though they're both grown and making me old, um, that I will always be there for them. And I would encourage you 
whenever that point comes in your lives to be a parent is to believe in your kids and stand up for things and, and just give them that support. Um, and hopefully you guys get that support from your parents um, at home as well right now. So um, stay safe, be careful and stand up and speak out. Yeah, and, and I think you said it very well. Remember why we do this, right? Why we're doing journalism, the importance of journalism, the importance of informing your school community, helping, potentially helping students like Reggie and others who are facing a variety of challenges, right? That's, that's why we do journalism. We don't do it just to get our name in the paper, just to be on the front page, just to be shared on social media. We do it because it's good and it's right and it's important. So Kathy, is there anything else that you want our students here in Michigan to know? If you guys believe in yourselves and you believe what you're doing is right, stand up for yourselves because no one else can ultimately do it for you. If you know in your heart that what you're saying and doing is fair, right, reasonable, um, do it, stand up for you. Um, it's an incredible feeling to know that you are making a difference in the world because ultimately um, we need more people that want to make a difference in the world because if we all just kind of are very passive about things, where's our country gonna go to? Um, as I've told my kids, be what's right in the world, not what's wrong. So that I would encourage you guys to be that, that light that shines and work for the greater good for all of us. So good luck in your endeavors. Um, and I wish you guys the best from Missouri. And Kathy, Kathy, thank you so much. Say hi. Thanks for your example. You're so yes. welcome. Leave me feedback on Facebook on my page. Have a great day. Yep, we, we will share that information on, on the Facebook page to everybody via email, but yep, find, find that Hazelwood v. Kohlmeyer Facebook page and, and join it. And, Join the conversation there. Kathy, thank you so much for your You're time. Welcome. You're and so welcome. everybody else for being here with us. Thank you so much again. Thank everybody you. stay thank safe. You. We will see you all hopefully really soon. Bye. Good luck, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.